Great God of that testimony from the uh, one of the critical witnesses in the Henry Segura case. That's uh, one of the uh, state employees who handles child support payments. The state is trying to claim that the defendant in this case killed four people, his girlfriend and three children, including his own son, because he owed so much money in child support. That's the theory. Troy Slayton is a criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor in California. He's joining us via Skype right now. Troy, it's good to see you again here on the Law News Network. Thanks for having me. So what do you make of this whole theory in this Segura case out of Florida? You know, they're trying to say there were four murders that by all accounts were brutal. You, know, you got three kids piled up in a bathtub. You know, two of them drowned, killed at the hands of at least one of their natural biological fathers and testimony revealed that all three of these kids looked up to this defendant as a dad. You know, what do you make of this case? Well, that's the state's theory of the case, but the defense has done uh, exactly what they're supposed to do in the last several days when they've put on the defense case in chief. And that specifically is to raise doubt, to give the jurors an alternate factual scenario that they can hang their hats on. Specifically, they raise the this story that the 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 decedent, the 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 mom uh, of the of the children, the mother of the children, uh, was wanted by a drug cartel for skimming money uh, and drugs off of shipments that she was a drug mule for. And they even brought in uh, DNA evidence that showed that one of these uh, cartel members what the DNA, some DNA found at the scene on a phone case was consistent with the DNA of this cartel member. That's you know, huge. We, we've got that evidence, but you know, the old uh, line is going that it's a partial DNA match. And so it's a, just a huge question of fact. Who does the jury believe here? Do they believe the defense expert in saying, hey, partial match is, I'm sure we're gonna hear tomorrow, enough to raise reasonable doubt. The state's gonna just turn around and say, partial matches aren't enough. And the state right. tried to right. inject some evidence in there that this partial match actually just could be giving evidence of alleles of the defendant, even though I don't think the state can really prove that either. So it right. just, it injects a lot of doubt into the case, but is it enough to, to really doubt the prosecution's case in chief? Well, here's one thing that the defense DNA expert said is that that DNA found would not be found in 99.5% of the Latino population. And this other person that they're pointing to is Latino. And, and so that is some very powerful evidence. I mean, when we're thinking about convicting someone of murder, of branding someone a murderer for life, potentially sending them to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole or the death penalty in many jurisdictions, including Florida, uh, we have to be sure and have be 100% free of any reasonable doubt, which I'm sure the defense attorney will argue in closing arguments, that the jurors need to be 100% free of reasonable doubt. And the fact that there's DNA that is consistent with another person, that's huge. Well, at least partially consistent. You know, I, I think that this whole case is gonna hinge on how each side characterizes this in closings. And, and I already also, teed it up. And it, also how the jury views the defendant's own testimony. The defense took the rare step here in having the defendant testify. And in my experience, when a defendant chooses to exercise his constitutional right to testify on his behalf, uh, it, it, number one, it, it raises huge fears in the hearts and minds of defense counsel because you never know what could happen. But it really changes a trial like this into whether or not the jurors like and believe the defendant himself. Oh yes, certainly. I want to listen to some of the defendant's testimony now. Uh, you know, he's 
admitting that he's lying about some things, and then there's other things that he conveniently can't seem to remember. So, uh, you know, I thought he came across as a likable guy, but some of our other analysts are just like, we don't believe this guy. He's admitting he's a liar. He's, you know, he can't remember other things that you would think he would be able to remember. Let's listen to some of his testimony now, and we'll be back in a second. Phone records that every time you ever call Brandy from your, your phone that you communicate with all the women with, you star 67 her. Why is that? She had a habit of, like, stalking, stalk calling, I guess you'd call it. She'd call, like, if I don't answer the phone, she's going to call until I answer the phone. Okay. Why didn't you want her doing that? Because if I'm with another female and she's calling that particular phone, then the other female will be wondering, who is that? Um, why did you leave your main phone, your primary phone, at your house when you went over to Brandy's house? on the 19th to hook up with her, but not on the 17th? Um, if I'm not mistaken, I left it both times. Okay. Why did you leave but it? The right reason now? I left it was because Malika, she had a way of, anytime I was somewhere I wasn't supposed to be, she knew about it. She was. She could, I got an email address, she can get him an email address, she get him a Facebook account. I don't care what I did, she found out about it. So I just left the phone there and took the phone that she didn't know about. Okay. Um, what about the deleted texts? Um, why did you delete texts from Brandy? I didn't didn't need them no more. I didn't, wasn't trying to, you know, for, I didn't want to see them, and I didn't want Malika to see them because it was in my phone that Malika would be going through sometimes. Okay. It was certain, it was some text in there that I didn't want Malika to see. All right. Now, we saw a text about getting rid of the car. Can you tell the jury, uh, despite the lack of physical evidence having anything to do with this case, why you wanted your buddy to get rid of that Monte Carlo? That don't really have anything to do with this case, though. I know, but why, why specifically did you want, not want the police poking around that Monte Carlo? Because it was stolen. Okay. When and where was it stolen from? I don't remember what year, but it was stolen from Crystal River. Yeah. Okay. Um, what was your well, intent? Not Crystal River, but Home of Salsa, I think. What was your intent for the Monte Carlo? To restore it, fix it up, and drive it, maybe sell it. I don't know. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. Okay. And the, uh, to this day, the actual VIN number for that? Now, you, you replaced the VIN plate on the dash, right? Well, I, I didn't, but someone did, yes. Okay. The actual VIN, though, is still stamped on the engine block, correct? Well, I replaced the VIN in, in um, Dash. It was changed. It was swapped out. The VIN, original VIN, it still got stickers on the car. Like, you know, it'll show you that the original VIN number is still, you know, it's opposite from the one that's in the Dash. So if anybody ran that VIN, it would, it would to this day, come back stolen? Yes. <clears throat> um, I want to talk about the uh, the the revolver that both um, uh, your friend Mr. Moore and your friend Mr. Thornton saw you with back around July sometime. Did you have a revolver back around July? Um, it wasn't a revolver in July, but I had a gun in July. Okay. And um, what ended up happening to that gun? T tell us the whole deal about how. You got rid of that gun. Why? What? What all happened? I was working in Alabama. Uh, my cousin called me. He was in Long Beach, Mississippi. He called me. Said he had um, had some issues with some guys. Wanted to know if I can come by and you know, get half his back. Since I was like an hour, or two hours away, I said, "Yeah, sure." So I rode over there. One thing turned to another. It turned into a shootout. Um, that's when I. That's when I had got shot. So what you told the police about getting robbed and all that was not accurate? No. Okay. You didn't want to tell them you'd been in a shootout. Okay. What happened to the, the gun that you had uh, after that shootout? My cousin took it back with him. Okay. Now, uh, the, the injury that you suffered in that shootout, you, got, you actually got shot in the stomach, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And that's why in the picture we see that big, like, eight or nine inch incision on your stomach. Have you had intestinal surgery? Um, well, they went in and they had to search for the bullet because they didn't have time to do x-rays. And they found a bullet down in my groin. So it was, I had 
they had, I don't know how many staples, but they stapled my stomach back up. Okay. Had you, uh, did you have to miss work as a result of that? Yes. Now, in late November, around the time these murders occurred, were you back to full duty at work, or were you still restricted activity, restricted ability to do your job? No, sir. I was still on light duty. Okay. Okay, Troy, so what do you make of this guy? I mean, he, he's on the stand. He's talking about a stolen car. He's talking about changing the VIN numbers on the car. He's talking about having multiple phones so that his wife doesn't find out about his girlfriends. At one point, I think in another clip, he, they ask him how many girlfriends he had, and, and he, I think he said three, and then he qualifies it with in Tallahassee. You know, so apparently there are other ones out there. So, you know, but you raise an interesting point. You know, usually in law we would take something like that and say, well, if he's willing to confess to all this stuff, is he being honest with us about everything else? Right. I mean, ultimately, the jurors are the judges of the facts, and they're going to be the ones who are assessing and judging his credibility. When a person admits to doing things wrong, uh, that sometimes in the law is called a, a statement against penal interest when you admit that you committed some sort of crime. And uh, jurors are often instructed to place more weight on that. Ultimately, it'll be up for them to decide. But um, it, it really it could give the impression that he is coming clean, that this is the time he's here in court and he's laying it all out for them and even revealing some embarrassing facts. Well, he seemed to handle his embarrassing facts with a, a degree of um, charm that perhaps explains why he needs so many phones. Uh, you know, how does a jury take the, the guy? Do they just take him as sort of a chummy guy or are they really diving into this saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, you're admitting to all this stuff. I don't really like you and, and I think that you, you're just leading way too um, questionable a life. Well, we, we have no idea what is in the mind of each one of the individual jurors. And look, sometimes jurors acquit when they should convict. Sometimes they convict when they should acquit. Sometimes they get it right. We, we really have no idea how each individual juror, based on their life experience, based on everything that hap has happened to them that brought them to this moment, whether they're going to like him or dislike him or believe him or disbelieve him. Uh, we just don't know. Yeah, I want to play another clip here because it, this is a very short one. It's a couple minutes long, but he, he, he can't seem to remember the size of his own pants. You know, and, and he goes into a couple other things that I want to talk about. So let's listen to this. Okay. 36, 38, one or two. Um, and are you left-handed or right-handed? I'm left-handed. Um, we heard testimony about you going over to uh, Adam Thornton's house the day after the murder. Did that happen? Yes. What were you guys doing over there? Um, just hanging out. Um, <clears throat> shot the bull and arrow. Um, showed me where his hunting stands was. Uh, we hung a red line for his for his dog to run back and forth um, throw the football uh. when you were uh, when you were shooting bow and arrow and all that were you having to retrieve some of the arrows yes where were the arrows going um, well, he had like this big old hay like a big hay bale and, and he had like a you know, something in the front of it with X's on it and that was the target and like right behind it was the little bushes or woods or whatever Okay. What a fence. Did you have to go into the bushes to get arrows on a variety of occasions while you were over there? I didn't jump across the, the Did you fence, have to reach but in there, I, I mean? reached in there, yeah. Okay. Um, is that where you got those little tiny scratches that we see in the pictures? Yes. Okay. What about the older wounds on your hands? Um, you said you had been doing some welding still, even though you were on light duty. Um, are those burns from uh, welding and working with fire and all that at your, at your job? Like, to tell you the truth, I don't even remember. Like, it could have been a burn. It could have been me hitting my knuckle up on something. But 9 out of 10 was a burn. I got, I got burns, like, all over my hands, my arms. You've heard the suggestion that you killed Brandy and her three children. Yes. Is it in you to Heaven. kill anybody, let alone three children, including one of your own? Heavens no. Especially not the twins. They, they were like my kids as well as more than Javante, actually. I raised them more than I did Javante. I have no further questions for the witnesses at this time. Carl. 
So there's a clip where you've got the defendant on the stand basically testifying to potentially save his own life because this is a death penalty trial. And he's telling the jury that he, A, he can't remember the size of his own pants, and then B, he's talking about shooting bows and arrows with his buddy the day after his girlfriend, who he admitted he had just slept with, and his own son were found savagely murdered. And Troy, I look at that and say, look, I mean, I know the size of my own shirt, my own trousers, and if something like that happened to me, I don't know if I'd be out shooting bows and arrows with my buddy. Well, there is no textbook on how somebody is supposed to act when something of this uh, tragic nature, of this epic proportion uh, happens to you. There's really just no guideline. Everyone grieves differently, and I don't think jurors could read too much into that. However, they're also asked to use their common sense. And so if this just doesn't feel right to them, then that may very well be the tipping point for them to convict. You know, so we've got those factual issues that um, I, I was back and forth with in this testimony. Overall, how do you think the defendant came across on the stand? I, I, I agree with you. He came off as affable and, and likable, and uh, his story seemed plausible. Uh, whether or not it was believable in the mind of each of the jurors doesn't really matter as long as he's able to convince one juror because in a criminal case, you need all the jur you need a unanimous verdict. You need every single one of the jurors to agree that the prosecution was able to prove their case beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. And if even one juror has that reasonable doubt, then it's a mistrial. It's a hung jury. Well, that's, that seems to be the next question here. I mean, where do you think this thing could go? Do you think this thing is ripe for a mistrial? Uh, I think that based on the uh, evidence of other people confessing to the crime, uh, we, we had a somewhat discredited uh, witness who testified that he was part of a conspiracy to kill this uh, woman. And, and that person that he, that he said did that testified uh, and, and denied it. Um, we have that DNA evidence. To me, that's enough of a reasonable doubt. I we're can, talking about potentially sending someone to their death. Well, that, that's the next question on the back end of this here. You know, I mean, so let's say the jury convicts, but can they convict and then say, you know, this is just not the kind of stuff that we want a death penalty to attach to? Well, they could. I mean, but if there was ever a case that seemed appropriate for the death penalty, uh, a person killing a, a mother of three and then murdering three innocent children, no matter what the uh, disagreement was, and we're talking about $20,000, I, I mean, to, to kill your own child and, and two others that basically looked up to you as a father uh, for $20,000, that's going to be a, a hard pill to swallow for a lot of jurors. And if they're presented with some other, some other possibility that they can hang their hat on and say, you know what, maybe he is guilty, I think he's guilty, I'm pretty sure he's guilty, but the prosecutors just weren't able to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, then that may just be the very thing that uh, hangs this jury or even results in an acquittal. Well, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, let's just assume for the sake of argument, if we were to have a case where a death penalty uh, could theoretically be exacted, and I'm not saying whether I agree or disagree with the death penalty, that's why I'm couching this in hypotheticals and theoreticals, mm -hmm. but if there were to be a case where we as a society might want to look and say that's a death penalty case wouldn't we not want to have all these evidentiary predicaments here yeah absolutely i mean the the death penalty is ultimate it's it's final there after an execution there's no further appeals and there have been instances of executions in this country when we find later discovered evidence that uh, exonerates the person that was executed. So, and I, again, I'm not making a statement either in favor of or against the death penalty here, but we do need to make sure if we are going to impose that ultimate punishment, we have to be darn sure that 
there is no possibility of of we of us getting it wrong. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Now, let's talk just quickly about cross-examination here. I thought that the state left way too much on the table with this guy. I thought the cross-examination was weak. Uh, it was way too short. It could have been much more direct. I thought that the defense was asking too many close-ended questions. You know, they, they were, it almost sounded like the defense was cross-examining their guy and that the prosecution was just giving him a chance to tell his story all over again. If I'm the prosecutor, I want to be nailing in on close-ended questions. You know, and then you went and did this, and then you went and did that, and really trying to force him into a narrative. That's what cross-examination is all about. It's about the attorney laying out a factually correct ethical narrative that the witness can't get out from underneath. They have to admit that those facts are true. I didn't think this cross-examination accomplished any of that. Well, prosecutors are notoriously bad cross-examiners because uh, most of their uh, witnesses are professionals. They're, they're police officers, they're uh, criminalists, they're crime scene investigators, and they know how to uh, run with the narrative and they know how to tell the story. And so usually prosecutors, when they're questioning a witness, they say, oh, what happened? And then what happened? And what happened next? So then what did you do? And, and the witnesses, uh, police officers and, and other state's experts know how to run with that. But defense attorneys, they're the ones that really need to be experts in cross-examination. When I'm cross-examining a witness, I want all the attention on me. I want the jurors looking at me. I'm telling the story and I'm just looking to get the witness to say yes, 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 agreeing with exactly that, my version of the events. Well, you will have to teach a class in cross-examination to all the prosecutors in the world. So, Troy Slayton, attorney, Los Angeles, California, current criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor. Thanks a lot for joining us again here on the Law News Network. Thanks for having me, and I look forward to being with you again soon. All right, we'll see you again sometime soon. So that'll wrap up our day here on the Law News Network.